This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best place to build, design, and host your portfolio. When you look around the internet, the conversation about cameras is completely insane. Whether you're watching YouTubers or digging through the forums of DP Review, people get very angry about their cameras. They either want to defend what they love or criticize what they hate, but why can't we do both? I mean, I always have the most negative things to say about the products I enjoy the most because I use them all the time. We'll start with the camera I've been using the most for the past few months, and that's the Canon. Are. And so you know my perspective is as a hybrid shooter, I shoot like equally photos and videos. You might have a different perspective, may not care about one or the other, but I use it for both. And I was moving to the art from the Canon 5D Mark IV, which I'll talk about later. An amazing camera. I did not expect to be replacing it with this much more affordable, almost entry level mirrorless, but it took its place and I've been using it a lot lately. Which of course means I've been discovering a lot of problems. So let's start with the biggest issue of all for me is just all of the usability stuff. Everything on the back of this camera, it's not what I want it to be. I'm not the first one to complain about the touch bar that they added up here, which to me is virtually useless. I mean, I, I actually, I don't think it's even assigned to anything right now. But much worse than extra controls is missing controls and it drives me crazy that there is no jog wheel back here and no joystick up here, which are both, let's like, let's take out the 5D. They're both pretty standard on what you'd expect from traditional uh, professional Canons. You know, if you could, you could call the 5D like the beginning of the professional line. And this and this get used a lot. And the R improved a lot of the touchscreen controls. So you can do a lot more from the back of the screen, including changing ISO, changing your shutter speed pretty easily. Like the interface is well done, but it is a worse way to change anything. It's it's not an improvement at all. The best example is moving the focus selection point. It, it, it's very frustrating to have to do that with the screen because sometimes you just can't access it. The fact that there's only one card slot, this is one of the biggest things I already talked about when the camera was released. It's still not good, especially for a job. Like if we were shooting a wedding or something, I want to have two copies of it. I don't like having only one card slot in here. It makes me nervous. Another control I don't use, which I guess goes for all of the new Canon stuff is the RF lens spinning dial thing here. Um, I just found that either I accidentally used it if uh, you didn't have a modifier. So I had it set to adjust ISO. That seems very useful, right? You could just kind of slowly dial it in, make it brighter and darker, but that would just happen in the middle of a shoot if I just touched the lens the wrong way and all of a sudden my exposure is incorrect. Now let's complain about video for a second, which I use this for a lot. I mean, it's a decent video camera, but it has pretty mediocre dynamic range. Even when you're shooting in log, it only uses Canon log, which doesn't have a lot of dynamic range, especially not compared to some of the new cameras coming out right now, and especially not compared to like bigger cameras. Like the cine camera difference to mirrorless was huge at the time of this release, and now that gap is starting to shrink. So I don't like the way that this looks when I put it next to the bigger cameras. Everyone already knows this doesn't record in full frame 4K, which many cameras also do. The a7 III that I was using before this did, so that was a step back. And actually the 1080p that you're recording in full frame is pretty soft. To get the sharper 1080, which you've seen different examples of, there's a few YouTubers, both Potato Jet and Matty Hapoya, they both did tests showing how 4K and 1080 could look exactly the same, but in their examples, they were showing it in crop mode for both of them. When 1080 is cropped, it looks great. But when you're looking at it full frame, it's pretty soft on this camera, and that is not great. Still got a 30 minute record limit, and so do the new Canons. This is, I, how is this still happening? The new Sony doesn't, thankfully, but this, this should go away. I hate record limits. The way that you select frame rates and compression methods and resolution is a complete mess. It's just this big grid of options that I always confuse and sometimes I hit the wrong one. It's much better on both the newer Canons, the Sony's, better on Fuji's, everybody's got it better. The R just does it the worst. But we are talking about my favorite cameras today, so what's good about the R? Why is it my go-to? The photo quality is amazing. It has the same sensor as the 5D Mark IV, which was already very good. I love the colors out of it. The noise performance is excellent. I think that some people talk about that the dynamic range is less on Canons. I've heard people say there's like a one, two, three stop difference. This is not true. I mean, what I think they're seeing is ISO invariance. And what that means is as you shoot different ISO levels, on Sony's you're able to bring it up and down without degrading the image. So you can recover more shadows or highlights, but it doesn't actually add that much dynamic range. And in practical use, you're not gonna see a big jump between Sony and Canon photos. But professionals are using all of them. And if there was a few stop difference, they wouldn't be using the Canon. This wouldn't be a good camera if it was actually that much worse. So don't worry about that dynamic range thing. The photos are awesome. 
I can complain about cameras all day long, but there's one thing I can't say anything bad about, and that's our sponsor today, Squarespace. Squarespace has mobile-ready, responsive designs that are really easy to customize, so it looks like your brand, and as you upload your videos and images, they are all full quality, look fantastic to your future clients. So with the images, I like that you can just upload really large files and let Squarespace resize them down to the appropriate compression for the web. And then for your videos, you can either embed from YouTube or Vimeo and use their custom thumbnail too so that it gets rid of all that extra branding. It just looks like your videos are the product. You own this space. And that is such an important thing to do on the internet right now. Social platforms, are not yours, you're playing in someone else's playground. So go own a piece of the internet by using Squarespace today. And it's super simple and there's a free trial. So if you go to squarespace.com right now, you can just sign up, get started, build something in just a few minutes and it's gonna look great without even knowing what you're doing. Then when you're ready to launch, just go to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman to get 10% off your first domain or website. And I say first domain because you're gonna wanna create more. I mean, we have honestly, Squarespace is very useful. I've also hosted my podcast there. It does a lot of great things. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. And again, just go click that link in the URL below. And finally, one of the things that made me switch from the a7 III as my portable camera to the EOS R is the video color is just easier to work with. It's not exactly that it's, it's better. I think there's a lot of confusion about color science, but if you just wanna quickly grade something so it looks good, it's very simple with the R. And that leads me to my next favorite camera, the Sony a7 III which I don't have, uh, I actually sold it. So I have no camera, I don't have anything to hold in front of me. So without anything in front of me, let's just talk about the camera. Can I Photoshop something? Great, okay, perfect. I shot with this camera a lot. We brought it all over the world. Before that, I was using the a7R II as well, which was pretty similar in a lot of the ways. I've always thought both of them were better for video than the a7S II. I don't know why it was so popular because there was no good autofocus on it. But anyway, this is about the three. And this time we'll start by talking about the video features because that's what really brought me to the Canon. The 8-bit 420 codec on the Sony just wouldn't work in the extended dynamic range formats for me, like log and HLG. It was very frustrating to have such minimal dynamic range to get the good colors. Now, I think there are good color profiles on the Sony. Again, color science is a myth. A lot of people are confused about it. Profiles like Cine 2 and Cine 4 looked great and are pretty easy to grade and make them look nice, but they don't have a ton of dynamic range. And there's two things you notice in an image, no matter how small you're looking at it, the amount of dynamic range and just the overall color profile and the lighting. That also matters. Okay, but so lighting, dynamic range, and colors. And what would happen is if I got the good dynamic range with those extended profiles, the colors would kind of fall apart. I had a hard time grading them, especially HLG. It's just not meant to be used in a Rec. 709 profile. So the colors looked crazy. And if you shot in S-Log2 or S-Log3, which you should not do, the image was quite a bit softer. There's a ton of banding in any gradients and big macro blocking. And then similar to the R, when you shot in 1080, it was pretty soft, including the slow motion modes. They weren't very sharp at all, which was less of an issue than the R actually, because you were shooting in 4K most of the time because you could do full frame. So, but still, if you use 1080, it didn't look great. And then there's still the 30 minute record limit. Horrible, no cameras should have that ever. But don't get me wrong, the A7 III was revolutionary and might still be one of the best value cameras you can possibly buy. Like, the amount of features and quality that you are getting for that price is crazy and possibly unparalleled. Great photo quality, amazing low light performance, similar to the a7S II, to be honest. I mean, you could shoot in super low light. And for anybody that's still worried about Sony color, for one thing, they changed it in the new cameras. So this might be old news. But there is not really like a color science that all these cameras have when you're shooting raw photos. All of the color data is there. And if you want to match a Sony to a Canon, basically up to you. The way that you deal with the image is how it's gonna look. It's not the camera's fault if the colors look bad. You can make all these cameras look great. When it comes to video, it's a bit of a different story. Since a lot of the color is being baked into the image, it can be hard to extract something else. That's what I was really struggling with. That was my problem with it. Still, you should maybe go buy this camera. It's still a great camera even now. All right, let's get that Sony out of here and move on to the 5D Mark IV. This is the camera that I didn't think I'd replace. There's no way I thought that an EOS R, a relatively cheap sort of prosumer, consumer camera could replace a professional body like this that I've been using since the beginning of 5Ds. 
Starting with the 5D Mark I, that was my first big camera and I've just stuck with the line ever since. I really love the design and it's lasted because it's good. It didn't need a lot of changes for a long time because it's very easy to use and make great photos. And for a moment, with the Mark II, it was the only video camera in town, but I mean, that's a long time ago. <laughs> so lack of flip screen, I didn't think that was a problem until I started using one all the time and then I, I start to miss it. The biggest, best example is when I'm shooting portraits and I can't just do this because often I lower the camera and I'm trying to just look down. That inability is, is very frustrating. So I actually need to kneel down to look through the eyepiece. And that brings me to the autofocus. I have begun to much prefer the mirrorless style of autofocus where it's actually locking on to parts of the face. So for example, with this, I might put an autofocus point on, let's say my eye. I'm a good example because I wear glasses all the time. And it might try to focus on the front of my glasses here instead of on my eye because there's no such thing as eye or face detection in this. Most of the current mirrorless cameras have some sort of eye and face detection. So it is tracking exactly what the subject looks like. And the autofocus sensor is separate from the image sensor on DSLRs. So the focus points, unless you're doing like a uh, live view autofocus, it's possible for it to be completely miscalibrated with what the lens is doing. So the lens thinks that it's focused at one meter away, but the sensor is telling you that the focus point is 1.2 meters away and that mismatch can get everything completely wrong. The body is relatively big now. I mean, it's, it's very big. A lot of that is because of the mirror box up here, which is just part of it being a DSLR. And then also the flange distance. So the distance between the end of the lens and the sensor is much smaller in all mirrorless cameras and much bigger inside a DSLR. And the reason for that is it needs space for the big mirror to flap up and down. It needs that clearance. So traditionally these older cameras were all a lot thicker and that's how we've got these smaller bodies now. If we look at the video features, it was okay when it came out, but now it feels extremely limited. You can only shoot full frame in 1080, and if you're shooting 4K, it crops to one point, was it 1.7 or one point? It crops so much that I never, ever shoot 4K on this camera. Not to mention that the file size was enormous, like huge, huge files. You'd just get a few minutes out of a 64 gig card. So I would just, I would not shoot 4K on this camera. But let's remember, why is this such a timeless camera that's gonna go down in history? Even when they stop making 5Ds, we're gonna remember them as like a legendary digital camera. This is used so widely by so many professionals. It's probably, it's the camera that the most of my photography friends have always used. A lot of that is the control layout. It's just really classic. There are dedicated buttons for the most common and important features. You've got scroll wheels for changing things, which uh, does not equal the same way that they are used on the R. And then the joystick as well. All of that just like, it adds up to being very simple to use. And the image quality is great. This is sort of the beginning of like the plateau of photo quality where, uh, you know, it's getting a little bit better, but you kind of stop noticing the differences a little bit. So modern cameras will have a little better high ISO. The dynamic range is still improving. Nothing crazy has changed. And in general, you're not gonna spot the difference between a 5D Mark IV and, you know, let's say a Canon R5, whatever. New cameras aren't that different. And now in the summer of 2020, the mirrorless landscape has completely changed. The A7S III, the R6, the R5, there's gonna be an A7 IV at some point soon. And I don't know about you, but I feel very conflicted about all this. It's harder to navigate this space than it ever was before. So I'm talking to a lot of other great YouTubers on the podcast about what the next great camera is gonna be. So if you search for the Stallman podcast either here on YouTube or in Apple Podcasts or Overcast or Spotify or Google, whatever, Search for the Stallman podcast, you'll find it. Now go over there and subscribe. And now I've got one camera left and it's what I'm recording on now. So I'm gonna have to make a change. So this big chunky thing, this is the Canon C200. It's my favorite video camera we've ever had. I absolutely love it. It was a big investment at the time. It's come down in price a little bit since then, but it can do a lot and the image looks great. And that doesn't mean I can't complain about it. The worst thing is just a missing feature. It doesn't support 10 bit. And if you're noticing a theme, that was the same problem with all of these other cameras. This is why it's a huge deal that the A7S III has it and the R6 and the R5. 10 bit 422 on those cameras is very important because all this can do internally is either 8 bit 420 or 12 bit raw. And there's a world of difference between those. Shooting raw takes up a lot of space, needs faster cards. Or if you're shooting eight bit, you have some of those same limitations when you try to grade the footage. Now, granted the eight bit on this thing looks 
good. It's like at a higher bit rate and just looks kind of cleaner than on all the others. It's easy to work with, but it's still, I mean, it, it should have 10 bit built in. And then what drives me really nuts is what's output to the preview monitors is not the same as what's being captured to the card, especially when you're shooting raw. So you wanna use C-Log2 as your highest dynamic range profile to get the most out of this camera. But when you shoot raw, it can't preview that out of the monitor. This is fixed in the C500 Mark II or the C300 Mark III or Alexa's or Red's or like every other camera. No camera does this, it's really weird. But it means that you don't know exactly the exposure you're getting until you go back and grade the footage. And you're wondering what this is, I'm just still recording audio through this camera because it was easier. And actually the 4K sensor is not super sharp, which is sort of interesting. Like it looks, it looks great, I, it looks nice. But if you compare my A-roll talking head footage to say Marquez, you can see a difference. His stuff is sharp. Mine is, I mean it's sharp, but his is sharper. <laughs> to get the maximum dynamic range out of this, it is rated at ISO 800. So that is really what you wanna be shooting, especially in RAW to get all of the shadows and highlights. But if you underexpose at all, the shadows get very noisy. So you kind of always need to expose one or even two stops over to get a clean image. And I've seen people complain about those noisy shadows not realizing that you just need to treat this camera a little bit differently. If you do, it's gonna give you a great image. But the good about this camera, it just has the most beautiful video I've ever shot. There's better cameras out there, I don't get to use them <laughs> yet, someday. But the image that comes out of here is pretty beautiful and inspires me to light things better and create more interesting images because I just like to play with the files afterwards. They come out so rich and textured. A good camera can really inspire you. And that's the main thing I wanna say in all of this, in this video, what I wanna get out there is you should not be afraid to criticize your great cameras. It doesn't mean that it's an attack on you. And conversely, don't get mad on the internet for people liking cameras. It doesn't mean they're a fanboy just because they like something that has a problem with it. All these cameras are deeply flawed. I mean, until lately, it feels like they're really getting better. But just because something can be criticized doesn't mean you have to get angry about it. Just enjoy these cameras because we are very lucky. They are better than we ever could have hoped for. We are so spoiled for cameras lately. So thanks for watching, guys. Again, if you want to hear more about this, hit up the Stallman Podcast, available in all podcast players. And I'll see you in the next video.